this has happened to me before, and it's probably happened to you guys too. Uh, you've got your favorite language, your favorite framework, and someone comes to you and says, here's Alfresco. It's running on this server, and we need you to integrate this, uh, this system with Alfresco. And, uh, and, or maybe you need to develop a custom application on top of Alfresco. And your first question that you ask is, uh, what is the API that I should use in order to connect with Alfresco? What is the best thing to use? Uh, and the answer is um, CMIS, CMIS, Content Management Interoperability Services. So um, what is that? It's kind of a mouthful to say. Uh, CMIS gives you a standard API for working with content repositories like Alfresco. So it's not Alfresco specific. It'll work with uh, other repositories, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, but, uh, but this gives you a way to uh, work with repositories that is standards-based, which I think is important. So what I want to talk about today are the first steps with CMIS. So first, you're going to pick CMIS as your preferred API for working with Alfresco. This is what we want people using when they're remotely connecting to the repository. We want you using CMIS. That's the preferred API. So you'll choose CMIS. Then um, I recommend that you use the Open CMIS Workbench to get started. And I'll show you what that is in a minute and why I think it's a good tool. Um, next, set up your development environment. This will be, relative, this will be very easy, uh, but I just want to mention it and, uh, and talk about a couple of things uh, related to this. Then there are some gotchas or some limitations, some best practices that you'll probably need to watch out for to make sure that you are uh, um, uh, watching your performance and also that you know the limitations of CMIS because you don't want to just blindly say, well, Jeff told me to use CMIS and then you go use it and you get halfway into your project and find out that you've got a major problem um, because of some of the limitations. And then last, there are some additional learning resources, sample code, entire uh, applications that um, are working on top of CMIS that you can take today and use those as starting points uh, for your applications or at least use them as examples. All right, so why CMIS? Just because Alfresco says that's the preferred API, you know, maybe you need some more convincing. Um, so first, it's an open standard. It's managed by Oasis. They manage all kinds of standards. If you're into that, you can go to the Oasis uh, website and you can read about all kinds of standards. Um, so it's an open standard and it has many vendors supporting it. So this isn't just an Alfresco thing. This is also supported by Microsoft, um, uh, FileNet, um, SAP, OpenText, IBM, um, several, several big, all the big players in ECM are supporting CMIS in some way. They're involved in writing the spec. They are making sure that their products are CMIS compliant. So, um, so there's broad vendor support for CMIS, which is great. Um, that also means that there are plenty of examples out there. So I've got some examples out there, and other people from Alfresco have some, and I'll point you to those. Uh, but there are others from other people. And so the beauty of CMIS is that because it is uh, cross-platform, you can go find a CMIS example that works with SharePoint, and it'll work with uh, Alfresco as well, assuming that they're using functionality that's present in both, uh, both repositories. I see some people that are like, yeah, not quite. But we'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Um, client libraries for many languages. So um, I listed some here. Uh, Java, Python, .NET, PHP, Objective-C, Android. These are all client libraries that are available in Apache Chemistry. Um, but there are other uh, client libraries available out there. So I know somebody's working on a Ruby one. There's a Perl library being worked on. Um, but these are the ones that are available from Chemistry. And there's a C++ one. A C++ one. A C++. Would you happen to be uh, Cedric? Yeah. Oh, hi, Cedric. Thanks for coming to my talk. This is, uh, <laughs> this is like a, a PhD coming to a lower level of class, I think, maybe, for, for Cedric. I don't know. Cedric is working on uh, the LibreOffice uh, integration, right, with uh, via CMIS. So if you want to use LibreOffice on top of a CMIS repository, um, then uh, on top of Alfresco or other repositories, then you can thank Cedric for, uh, for working on that software. So yes, thank you, a C++ library. Um, so, Apache Chemistry, so we've got Oasis writing the specification, and then we've got um, people working on implementations. 
And um, some of these implementations are available in Apache Chemistry. So there's a project called Chemistry, and it has three different things available uh, at uh, chemistry.apache.org. So there's a set of client libraries, which I already mentioned. There is a set of, uh, or there's only one, server framework. So if you happen to be writing your own server, which would be weird if you're at the Alfresco conference, but OK, whatever. You're writing your own server, and you want to make it Seamus compliant, then you can use uh, the server components that are available at, Open C at, um, at Chemistry. But the things that I want to talk about next are these uh, development tools. So there are two reference servers available at Chemistry. One's called the in-memory server, and the other one's called the file share server. Those do exactly what they would, you would think they do by the name, right? The file share server turns a uh, file system on your machine into a CMOS server. And the in-memory server creates a repository entirely in memory. And then once you shut down Tomcat, all your content goes away. And so obviously, not, a production, not for production use, but great for development purposes. So these are two server implementations that you can get from Apache Chemistry. Again, not for production use, but, but great for development. But the tool I want to talk about right now is called the Workbench. Uh, CMUS Workbench, sometimes called Open CMUS Workbench. Uh, and it is a swing application. It's, it's a bit of an ugly duckling. You know, you're not going to want to put this in front of your end users, of course, uh, because it's a, it's, it's, it is exactly what you're looking at here. But um, it is great for learning about CMIS. And also, as you start to do development, it's a, it's a really nice tool for debugging and for inspecting the repository. And it works great with Alfresco. So I'm going to show a, um, a quick demo. And in this demo, you'll see using the workbench to create, read, update, and delete some objects. We will look at some properties. And we will run some queries, execute some stuff in the uh, Groovy console, which is built into Workbench. And uh, we'll also inspect the Alfresco content model, which is something that you really can't do with out-of-the-box Alfresco without using code. And you can do it with the Workbench. So let's see how this works. Now, I'm a big fan of live demos. If you've been to my talks before, I do always do a live demo. And I'm trying something new this time, which is a, a recorded demo. And uh, I think it'll, it'll save some time. So let's find out. So it's a bit hard to read with the lighting, but we're connecting. This is the workbench, and we're connecting into Alfresco. There's a service URL. Every server has a service URL. And I have that list in a minute. And uh, you don't need to know it right this second. So we've, we've looked, and you can see, well, you may not be able to read that those are the folders in the root of Alfresco on the left-hand side. I'm creating a new folder called Workbench. I have a set of types that are deployed to my, uh, to my Alfresco server, and I'm picking CMIS folder. This maps to CM folder, as you would know it on, in an Alfresco content model. Now the uh, folder is created. I can drill into the folder, and let's put some content in there. Let's put a document in there real quick. So I click Create Document. Again, I've got a list of types uh, that I've deployed to Alfresco. And I'll just pick, um, if you've read any of my tutorials, I've got a Sumco white paper type. So I'm picking the white paper type. So you can see custom types uh, in the workbench through CMIS without a problem. Um, now I'm just picking a file off of, uh, off of the, work, uh, or the, the machine here to uh, set the content stream on this object. And I'll click Select and create document, and that object should show up in the left-hand side. There it is. Now, once the object is created, I can see all kinds of cool stuff about it. I can see its type. I can see the path where the uh, object lives. And I can see a set of allowable actions. So this is things that I'm allowed to do to that object. Maybe, can I check it out? Can I delete it, et cetera? I can see a list of all the properties of that object. So this is similar to what you would see in the Node browser in Alfresco Share. I can click over to the ACL. I can manage the ACLs. I can see the ACLs. We'll talk more about that in the gotchas uh, section in a minute. Um, and I can also perform some actions against this document. Maybe I copy it, move it, check it out, update the content stream, et cetera. OK? Now I've opened up the query uh, dialog. So I'm typing, I'll read this to you because I know you can't read it past row four. It says select star from SC white paper. It's a, it's a SQL-like query that's selecting from my custom type, SC white paper. And what comes back are about a, a half a dozen or so uh, results. And I want to narrow down that search. So just like in SQL, I'm going to use a where clause. Narrow down that search. So select star from SC white paper where CMIS name like 
um, percent sign sample dash a dash upd percent sign. And now it uh, narrows the search results set down to one. And you can see that every property came back. I selected star. You're going to get every property back. Um, but you can obviously do a select and then put specific properties in your, in your list there to restrict the list, which is a good performance tip. All right, so that's running queries. And obviously, the query syntax is much more complex than what I have time to show here. This is the Groovy console. The Groovy console in Workbench allows you to interactively run Groovy code that is already wired in to, uh, to, the, to use OpenSemus, and that'll work great against Alfresco. So here, I'm just running the exact same query that I just ran, but I'm using Groovy code to run it. So select uh, Seamus object ID and name, uh, as well as the content stream length from SC white paper. And then the results are show shown here in the bottom. So anything you can do through Open Seamus, you can do through this Groovy console. And there are a set of uh, shortcut methods that are shipped with the workbench that allow you to use even fewer calls when you're using Groovy in the workbench, which is kind of nice. Now, the last thing I want to show you in the workbench is the content type hierarchy tree. So I've uh, opened up document, and I see that some code doc is a child of uh, CM content or CMIS um, document. And then a child of doc is the marketing document. So I can click that and see all the properties, how they're defined in the content model, which is nice. And I'm showing that this particular property has a constraint on it. So if you've used Alfresco content modeling, you already know about constraints. And so I can get the list of items in my list constraint back through CMIS easily. So everything you're seeing here is 100% pure CMIS. There's nothing Alfresco specific about the interaction between this uh, Workbench client and Alfresco. So if you, if you have any questions about, you know, can CMIS do a certain thing, then using the Workbench to test that out is, is pretty decent if you, if, uh, if you don't have any other choice. Um, so, the Workbench is great for testing queries, inspecting the data dictionary, and one of the things that I see in the forums a lot are people asking, why can't I update the CM created by uh, property? Or, uh, you know, other things that, uh, that are not writable. And if you use the Workbench, you can look at that content hierarchy and inspect the uh, types, and you can see every single property and whether it's writable or not. And that'll save you some headaches to an answer that question for you, whether a property is writable. So like I said, if you have a question, can I do blah with CMIS, fire up the Workbench and, uh, and see whether or not it works. Because you know that that's pure um, spec compliant um, Java that's going on there. All right, so that's the Workbench. Now, I don't expect you to read these URLs, but I'm putting them in the presentation. And I, I should probably put these on a wiki page if they're not there already. These are the service URLs for Alfresco, the Seamus service URLs for every version that we've shipped with Seamus support. And because another problem that I see in the forums are people that are using 4.2, but they're using a 3.2 uh, service URL. The URLs are still in the product, but we don't want you to use those old, old URLs anymore. It's a completely different implementation. So as, the, as you move from version to version, try to use the latest and greatest service URLs uh, when you're writing your code. Now, what's cool is uh, this service URL is the only thing you need to know about any Seamus repository in order to make a basic connection to that repository. That's it. All you need is that URL. So if you want to use some, one of our competitors' products, or if you're forced to use it, or I don't know why you would want to do that, but uh, if you have to use something other than Alfresco, all you need is this equivalent in that other vendor. And your client that you're using, like OpenSemus, will figure it out from there. So you don't need to know anything special about that repository. Um, now, I'm going to talk about some differences in repositories in a minute. Uh, so let's keep that in the back of our mind. But uh, so anyway, I'll publish this. I mean, obviously, these slides will be on the website. And, and take a look at this list. In, and the heads up here is that in 4.2 uh, D, I think, these URLs changed again. So, We've got the 3.2 to 3.4 URLs, the 4.0 URLs, and now the 4.2 URLs are here. So um, just be aware that that's happened. All right. Um, I see, here's another, uh, I'm trying to, when I put this presentation together, I tried to think, you know, what are the most commonly sort of stumbling blocks that I see that people have? 
and I'll, I'll go to Stack Overflow, and people will be saying, you know, I'm doing a post, HTTP post with an HTTP client against Alfresco and sending, uh, you know, rest, making um, Atom Pub rest calls against Alfresco, um, and I'm having trouble. And my first question is, you know, yes, you can do that. You can use curl or any HTTP client you want to to make calls against Alfresco or any other SEMA server, but do you really need to and do you want to? It's much, much better. You'll save tons of time by using a client library. So maybe someone could, you know, there might be times when one of those client libraries isn't uh, good enough or, you know, maybe you've got some special reason or you're writing your own client library or whatever, but in general, uh, you should try to use a client library. Now, I'm going to assume that most of us in the room at, uh, are Java people. Uh, are, uh, well, Cedric, sorry. But other than Cedric, uh, anything else people are using as their main programming language besides Java? Or are we? Python. PHP and Python. Oh, great. So there's Node. Node? OK, great. So there are usually one or two Python people in my talks, which always makes me feel good because I maintain the, uh, the Python library for, for uh, CMUS. Uh, but um, but there's, it, it's overwhelmingly Java. So for the rest of my talk, I'll assume that we're talking about Java. And um, uh, so we'll come back to the PHP thing maybe in a minute. But in Java, uh, I, you know, Maven makes this so easy. You literally just use Maven, create a POM, put this dependency in there, and literally that's all you need in order to connect to Alfresco with CMUS. So it, it, is, uh, it is super easy to, to, to do that when you use Maven. So I'm just putting a, uh, a vote for, uh, for using Maven for your, for your next project, if it makes sense. Uh, but with CMUS, it's very easy. <clears throat> so let's look at a Java example here that will load some images into Alfresco. And I'm going to do it twice. The first time, I'm going to load it into Alfresco running on-premise. And this will be 4.2e Community Edition that I'm showing here. Uh, and then the second time I do it, I'm going to run it uh, the exact same code. I'm going to run it against Alfresco in the cloud. So Alfresco in the cloud supports CMUS. And so does Alfresco on-premise. And the only thing that's different is how the authentication works. So if you want to write uh, code that works against both, all you need to know is how to get that authentication handled, and the rest of it's CMUS. So let's see how we get a session, create a folder, check in some documents, and uh, set some properties. So it's super basic, but uh, it's, it's a decent illustration. So uh, this is 4.2e, Community Edition. Uh, I've logged into uh, a share site, and I've gone into a, an images folder, which is completely empty. It's a sad, empty folder. Now we go look at a, uh, a Java class. I've tried to pump up the font for you here uh, a little bit. And this, this particular class is going to uh, use the geographic aspect that we ship out of the box. And um, so first, let's look at create folder. Let's jump into the create folder method. Folders are super easy to create. All you need to know is the type of folder you're creating and the name of the folder. That's it. So um, you create a hash map. You set that object type ID to CMUS folder in this case. It could also be a custom type. And then I set the name, and then I call create folder. And I pass in that hash map. And that's it. You're going to get a folder object back. So it's really easy. Now we're creating the document. And it's similar. I need, uh, I need the, uh, the type, the name. And in this case, I need a hash map of properties. Now I'm using Apache Tika to do some metadata extraction from the binary file here. So I'm going to pull out the latitude and longitude that are stored in a JPEG, and we'll set those as uh, in the uh, CM lat latitude and or, uh, yeah CM latitude and CM longitude properties. Those are defined in the geographic aspect that ships with Alfresco. Now some of you may be saying, well, I thought that did that automatically in Alfresco, and it does. Um, but um, in some cases, when you do this through CMUS, that, that extraction won't happen. And it was just a handy example to, to, to do it myself using Tika. So don't be alarmed. But um, so anyway, so, we've, so this method that I'm scrolling through here is just grabbing that metadata, creating the hash map, grabbing the content stream from the file, and then I pass all of that into the CMUS create document method. So again, it's, it's very easy to just tell the folder, hey, create me a document. Here are the properties. 
if that document already exists, because in Alfresco, we don't let the object have the same name in, this, in, a, in a folder, then it throws an exception, the uh, CMIS object already exists exception, which I will catch. So let's go ahead and run this. And if I expand the, uh, the console here, we can see that it's just cruising through a directory on my hard drive, and it's grabbing JPEGs and putting those into uh, to my local repository here. And uh, we'll flip over, and when we refresh the folder, it should uh, show the, the new images. And there they are. And we can see that these all have the geographic aspect uh, applied to them because of that little, um, I don't remember the technical name of that little place mark uh, thing. Um, so, and if we scroll down, we can see the latitude and longitude are, are set as, uh, as properties. All right, so that was on-premise. Now, uh, th this code, by the way, is in Google code. It's called uh, Alfresco API Java Examples. And so you can grab this code. And I've recently refactored it so that it's really easy to run the exact same code uh, on-premise or on cloud. You make the choice. I don't care which one you use. So what I'm doing here is I'm changing the ancestor class. And I'll refactor this some more. It needs some help. But I'm just changing the ancestor class to inherit from base cloud example instead of base on-prem example. And now when I run this class, it's going to ask me to authenticate with Alfresco in the cloud. So now I'll use my Alfresco in the cloud username and password. This is an OAuth handshake that's happening here. And, uh, and then it gets the, uh, it gets the uh, credential back and then starts making seamless calls against cloud. So it is quite literally the exact, the exact same code. The only difference is how you get that seamless session because of the authentication there. So this means you can write one app and, and target it for uh, Alfresco in the cloud or on-premise. It doesn't matter. And I think this is going to just prove to you that the, uh, <laughs> the documents are in the cloud, but I think we can probably safely skip forward uh, at this point. OK, so Seamus does work in the cloud. Um, same calls. You can get your own API key for free from uh, alfresco.com slash develop. So there's no charge. You can run as many transactions as you want uh, through there. Some limits, like uh, maybe 50,000. Uh, hits a day or something, or I don't remember. If you need to see the exact details of, uh, of the rate limits, then let me know and I can get you that information. Um, so anyway, definitely look at that as an option. All right, well, let's talk about some gotchas. So the Seamus thing sounds pretty good. So, so what's the catch? Well, we're about to go through some. All right. So these are just some things that I want you to watch out for when you're thinking about whether Seamus is going to work for your project or not. The first thing is Seamus object IDs. That's, may not, that's Medusa there. You don't want to look at Medusa, right? Uh, the same thing is true for Seamus object IDs. You do not want to look at a Seamus object ID directly. Because if you inspect that string, you as Alfresco people, you're going to recognize the string. You're going to say, I know exactly what that is. And you may be tempted to start making logic in your code that uh, parses out that object ID. That is a huge no-no. You should never, ever look at that string and try to intelligently deal with that string, OK? So it's uh, treat object IDs as if they were opaque, random strings, even though they're not exactly random, OK? Because we, as Alfresco, we will change those, and we won't tell you ahead of time. We'll change them, and your app will break. So uh, you are able to persist those IDs if you need to, but just don't try to make any sense of them, is what I'm telling you, OK? Otherwise, you'll be turned to stone or whatever the story was with Medusa. I don't quite remember. Um, all right, next is queries. So first thing is queries are read-only. So it's nice that we have the SQL-like language that we can use for the first time ever in ECM land, if you don't count things like documentum query language, which most of us don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, but um, it's nice to have this query language, but it's read-only. So there is a select statement, but there is no update statement. So in order to make updates, you have to use the API calls. You cannot, you cannot do an update um, a query. So uh, it's, it's just one of the limitations. Next, do you really need everything? I mentioned this earlier. Um, do you want to do a select star when you absolutely probably you know, do not need every single property coming back. It's just, what are you going to do with all those, right? So um, limit your list to a specific list, and that'll improve your performance a lot. 
Um, do you need every row? I mean, if there are a million objects in your repository, do you really need all million of those objects? Probably not, right, for your search page. So, um, you know, limit that um, set that comes back. And there's a paging uh, in iterator that you can use to page through the result set. Okay, so that's queries. The next thing is on aspects. So, uh, I didn't mention this before, but um, Seamus 1.1 has recently come out. And I think Greg Milan is, has a session, if it's not immediately after me, it's at some point after me, that talks about what's new and what's coming uh, with Seamus. And um, I suspect he'll be talking about Seamus 1.1. Um, but in Seamus 1.0, which is what we support up until 4.2.d, Seamus has no idea what an aspect is. So here you've got all of us in Alfresco land going, aspects are awesome, let's use aspects, yeah. And then you start to use Seamus, and, and Seamus is going, what are you talking about? I don't know what that is. Um, so in order to fix that, there's something called the Alfresco Open Seamus extension. It's available at Google Code. You can go download it. And it's, it's fairly simple. I'll show you how it works in a second. But it allows you to do things like add and remove aspects uh, to objects even though Seamus doesn't really know what you're doing. So it's an, it's a, an Alfresco specific extension. Now, in 1.1, the spec has evolved to include something called secondary types. Secondary types, that's the same thing as an aspect. That's exactly what we call an aspect. Um, so that means if you're using 1.1, which we now support in 4.2D and higher, 4.2 community D or higher, um, you can add and remove aspects by changing a multi-value property called Seamus Secondary Object Type IDs. So you can, I'll show you how this works in a minute. So we're getting there with aspect support, finally, after like three years or four years or something. Um, but, uh, but it took the spe spec change to, to take care of that for us. So that's great. Now, if you need to do a select query that brings back as aspect defined properties, you have to use a join. And in two or three slides, I'll show you what that join looks like. All right, so to sort of to recap how aspects work, if you're using Seamus 1.0, so prior to 4.2, let's just say, then you're using 1.0. And that means that you need the extension. And so what you do is, before you get the session, you uh, tell Seamus that you want to use this object factory, which is an Alfresco-specific object factory. You're going to use this object factory, and then at that point, Instead of getting back documents, you're getting back Alfresco documents. And those things know how to, do, and folders are the same. Folders, Alfresco folders. You can then do things like if doc has aspect, right? Or if folder has aspect. And then you can say doc.add aspect, and then give it the ID of an aspect. So this would work like you would expect if you were using the node service or something like that. Um, so that's what the extension does for you. Is it, it makes it easy to work with uh, aspects. Now, if you're using 4.2 or higher, uh, then you can um, do it slightly differently, which is by um, grabbing this property, this property, Seamus Secondary Object Type IDs, and you can look in that uh, array that comes back and find out if your type ID, your aspect ID is in that list. And if it's in the list, it has the aspect. If it's not in the list, you can add it. And the way you add it, is by um, just putting the name of the aspect into that hash map and then calling update properties. And that's exactly how you would update any other multi-value property in Seamus. So it's kind of nice. It's, a, it's maybe a couple extra lines of code than what, what it is when you use the extension. But, um, but at least you're using um, pure uh, Seamus. This snippet and the snippet before it are on GitHub as, uh, as gists. Gists? Gists? I don't know how you say it, but that's, it's on GitHub, um, and it'll be in the presentation. Uh, and this, this one will be there as well. This is a query. I see a lot of people asking, how do I do a join for aspect-based uh, properties? And this is how you do it. Um, so I'm just join in this case, I'm selecting name, latitude, and longitude from document and from the geographic aspect. And then I'm joining that um, where the object IDs are equal. So it's just a join, and um, that's how you get back uh, aspects when you're doing uh, um, Seamus query language. Okay, a couple more gotchas. So, relationships. In Alfresco, Alfresco supports parent-child relationships as well as peer relationships, right? So I can have two objects that are related. One of them can go away. The other one still hangs around because they're just, they have a peer relationship. Or I could have a parent-child relationship. 
Here's a parent, here's a child. Parent goes away, child goes away as well. It's like a cascade delete. Um, unfortunately, CMIS has no idea what a parent-child relationship is outside of a folder that contains a document. So if you have an application today that uses parent-child relationships, you won't be able to work with those relationships uh, through CMIS, which is kind of a bummer. Um, the next limitation related to relationships is that, in general, CMIS can only work with child types of document and folder. So if, you, if you've extended the content model, which is, this is really common, maybe you have some uh, types that come off a of sys object instead of uh, uh, content or folder, then you won't be able to work with those objects um, through CMIS because CMIS only knows about documents and folders. That's true on relationships as well. Yeah, go ahead. That's that's true in the spec, but it's not true in Alfresco yet. Okay. So it's true that there is a, a new thing in 1.1 called CMIS item, which is exactly for this purpose, to support things that don't come off of document or folder. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have support for CMIS item in 4.2. And that would be a wonderful question to ask Greg is, hey, what's up? Where's item support? And there are a couple other things like that, too, that uh, I want you to take to Greg and say, hey, what's going on? Um, so that's one of them. So your relationship, if you have a relationship with another object that is not a child of document or folder, you can't work with that relationship. A CMIS will just, you, won't, you can ask for that relationship and CMIS acts like it doesn't even know that that relationship exists. So I think for some people this may be a problem and something to look for um, in, in your case. I think if you're starting your content model from scratch, you can deal with it, right? But for people that are sort of going back to existing applications where they've already done this, then it's, it's a little bit harder to deal with. OK, ACLs. You can manage ACLs in Alfresco through CMIS. What you cannot do is set or unset the inheritance on the ACL. So you guys all probably know that in Alfresco, you're, uh, an object inherits by default the ACL of its parent object. Um, and sometimes you would like to, it to not be the case. You want to go to an object and say, hey, stop, stop inheriting that, that ACL from the parent. And unfortunately, there's no CMIS call um, to do that. So the best way to work around that is to write a web script, honestly. Just write the web script and then call the web script and, and maybe pass it a node ID that would break the inheritance or set the inheritance, whichever one you want to do. But the spec has no concept of ACL inheritance, and therefore, our um, CMIS won't allow you to do that. This is a grab bag of some other things. We've already talked about the first one. Um, users and groups, I think this is intuitive. Most people wouldn't expect to be able to create users and groups through CMIS. I think it'd be nice if you could, but CMIS just cares about documents and folders, pretty much. So no, users and group, no user and group creation. Um, this is one of these 1.1 things, so creating and changing types. It would be awesome if you, through CMIS, could say, I need a type. And I'm looking in the repository, and I'm not seeing the type that I need. Therefore, I'm going to programmatically create the type. I mean, how long have we been waiting to get out of this XML sort of hell that we're in, right, in, uh, in content modeling? Um, and this is the road out, I think. Um, the problem is that we don't support this yet. So 1.1, CMIS 1.1 has something called type mutability, where you can do exactly what I just said. You can create types and aspects, or secondary types, uh, through the API. But we don't have it yet, and I hope to have it soon, but, um, but it's not in the, in the product. But well, that'll be awesome, because then you can write a fully self-contained application that somebody could deploy to a repository that has no, your app has no knowledge of their, of their content model at all. Your app could then interrogate the content model, deploy the model that it needs, and now your app will have exactly what it needs. So I'm sure it'll be that easy, but uh, it, it'll be better than what we have uh, at the moment. The last thing is categories and tags. We have no support for that through CMIS. So you know Alfresco has categorization, it has tagging, native tagging capability, and that's not accessible. That's another common thing that I see people asking for. How do I get the categories for this node? I'm using CMIS. You have to write a web script right now. That's the, that's the answer. Now, the technical committee is working through some social, thinking about some social features to add to the specification. So if you have, and I don't know whether tags will be included in that or not. Uh, Cedric, you may know, but. Category 
Yeah, then you could fetch it that way. But there's no single call to say, hey, node, you know, give me the categories or give me a list of tags. Yeah, but at least it's worse than nothing. It's better than nothing. <laughs> yes, yes, it is better than nothing. Um, but it would be cool if uh, some of the new social features in CMIS and the spec that are being discussed, if you have thoughts about how, whether or not, or what the specific features in social ought to be in the spec, then you can go uh, join the CMIS technical committee at OASIS. All right, I need to, um, to speed it up a bit here and so that I leave some time for a couple of questions. Um, if you're writing an application with CMIS that only deals with Alfresco, like you don't care about any other repository, first of all, thank you, that's very kind of you. Uh, but uh, second of all, uh, then you don't need to worry about this very much. But some people, many people, are developing applications that need to work on SharePoint, as well as Alfresco, as well as FileNet, as well as OpenText. When you're doing that, there are a lot of things you have to pay attention to because even two or more repositories that say they're seamless compliant could be very different in how they operate. Um, the key to figuring this out is something called repository info. That tells you exactly what a repository can do. So for example, I'll just, there are a bunch of differences. I'm just going to name a couple just so you get the idea. Multi-filing. Alfresco, you can have an object and it can live in multiple folders. It doesn't have to live in only one folder. Okay, um, that not every repository supports that. That's called multi-filing. So you can ask a CMS repository, "Do you support multi-filing?" And then the repository comes back, "Yes, I do. No, I don't." Okay. If you write an app for Alfresco and you assume that all other CMS repositories also support multi-filing, you will have a broken app when they try to deploy that to FileNet or SharePoint or whatever. I don't know whether FileNet or SharePoint is multi-filing or not. I'm just using that as an example. Um, another one is search. Some we allow you to search for keywords and full text in the exact same query, right? That's how Alfresco works. Some repositories, you can only search for one or the other, and you can never combine them in the same query. So that's another, that's another difference between this that would really throw off your, your coding if you, if you weren't checking for that before you um, wrote your code. There are other differences, and you should look at the spec and you should make the call to repository info and see what comes back, and then figure out whether your application is affected by that. The other thing is get allowable actions. Every object can tell you what you're allowed to do based on who you're logged in as right now. So you can obviously, if you have a folder and you want to try to create a document, you can do that. If, if you don't have the permissions, you'll get an exception. Uh, but you could also ask the folder, hey, am I allowed to create this document? And the reason why you might want to do that is maybe in your user interface, you want to hide the create document button, right, based on what their access is. So always inspect the get allowable actions uh, to see what comes back. And then look at how types are defined. Um, in, in Alfresco, we namespace all of our types and all of our properties. But not all repositories do that. Some of them have different um, requirements or rules for what, you can, what allowable characters there are in types and properties. And so um, when you're trying to create content models that are going to work across multiple repositories, you have to take that into account. So where we are right now is you would, prob you would definitely have to create a, a content model for every repository that you want to support. Um, Jeff? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Some are using IDs somehow, and then you're screwed when you, you're yeah. decoding that, which works in Alfresco, but doesn't in, in others. Yes, I agree. You cannot always assume that a path is uh, constructed by using the names of the objects that make up the path, because not all repositories do that, yeah. which is mind-blowing, but, um, but that's how it works. I mean, so that's, a, that's another good, di that's a good difference. I should probably add that um, to that slide. Um, so, Jay Brown, who works at IBM, and Florian Mueller, who used to work for Alfresco but now works for SAP, um, and myself, the three of us wrote this book. It's called Seamus and Apache Chemistry in Action. And I'm not, I hate it when people are like, trying to sell stuff, but it's a great reference, I'm told, for CMIS 1.0 and, and 1.1. And it covers both of those versions as well as Groovy and Java examples. And then there are some sections in there for Python. It's a small section, but it's in there. Uh, and .NET and PHP. 
and Android and iOS. So we have examples, working apps for all of those uh, example for all those languages, in the book using Seamus. And there's a discount code if you want to if you want to buy it. Um, I, I want to show you some code that comes with the book because I think this is I hope this is going to be a great learning resource. So when we started writing the book, we said, okay, let's think immediately about the application that we want to have. So when you read the book, you're, you're going to build an application that on, sits on top of Seamus. What, you know, what framework should we use? What language should we use? And we had a debate, like we all do, about what the best one would be to use. And then we finally decided, this is stupid. People don't care about learning Play or you know, uh, Scala or whatever. They want to learn um, Seamus. And so this application is built in old school servlets and JSPs with zero frameworks being, <laughs> being used at all. And I think it's great because it, it gets you, if you've never used whatever framework we would have chosen, you don't have to learn that framework. You can just learn Seamus in the context of something that you're probably already familiar with, which is servlets and JSPs. And I'll just show you this just briefly here. Um, so this, will run, this application will run on any Seamus server. It'll, and I'm showing here how to do it on Alfresco. So with the book, I ship a little Alfresco content model that's, that's compliant with the book. And then you go into your um, session factory and change the service URL that we talked about earlier to point to your Alfresco server. I've tested it on 4.0 and 4.1 and 4.2. So I don't know about before 4.0, but it should work. Um, so you change the uh, session factory, start the application. It's a simple war that you'll deploy and up pops the application. Um, now, the application is like a, a music sharing site or something. Like we upload music and videos and artwork and try to share that and collaborate on it with, with our um, fellow artists or whatever. So when you get to the blend, you click this install link and give it your uh, name and password, and that'll load in a bunch of test data. We got a bunch of public domain like uh, movies and graphics and stuff. And we loaded those in. Those are now loading into Alfresco. That gives you some data to, to work with, you know, to play with and see how it works. So the data is loading in there. I should probably uh, speed it up a bit. Uh, the data is loading in. And then we'll switch over and see the, um, the application. I want to point out just one small feature um, of this application. Hopefully, here we go. OK. Um, so I log in. And now I see all the data that was just uh, uploaded. And I can, uh, the same data is in Alfresco. You kind of get that uh, for, for now. But this could easily be running in SharePoint or, um, or the, the in-memory CMS server or whatever. So here are the documents that I've uploaded. Here is the, uh, in the art folder. I can, I can sort of browse a list of items in the art folder. I can get a little preview of the thumbnail. I can see all the properties that are on this object. Um, we can also do uh, video. We've got a little video player embedded here. So if I jump over to video and open this guy up, then we've got an embedded player that's uh, playing right out of, the, right out of Alfresco. Um, we've got tags. The tags here are not actually Alfresco native tags. This is just a multi-value field in, in uh, the custom type. So I'm just adding a tag and saving that. Um, so it's a nice little app that's, like I say, servlets and JSPs. But the cool thing about it is in the, um, oh, it's just showing search. So it's got search for tags and keyword search and full text search and all that stuff. Uh, but in the upper right-hand corner, there's a link that says Insights. It's impossible to see out there. But when you click Insights, the UI changes and all of the uh, Seamus calls that we make in order to build the user interface are displayed to you. So if you're looking at something and you're saying, hey, how did he get that list of tags? Or how's that working? You can click Insights, and then that call shows up right by that spot in the UI. So you can see exactly which calls are, are, um, are taking place there. So um, that's the sample app. If you don't want to buy the book, you can still get the code. It's on GitHub. So just go grab the code. It's all good. Um, not a problem there. All right. I'm, I see a couple of people have questions. I'll get to those. Uh, before the next speaker comes. Um, if you have questions that we don't get to, find me in the hallway, uh, come to the experts bar, or ask questions in the Alfresco API forum. That's what that forum is for. Many people use it for other things, but it's really for the public API and the CMS API. That's where the questions get asked. 
So go to that forum at forums.alfresco.com and ask questions. And um, yeah, these are the steps that we went through. Use CMIS as your preferred API. Uh, use Open CMIS uh, to get started and as a, I think, a great develop, uh, development tool. Um, use, uh, use a client library. Don't use the bindings uh, directly if you can help it. It'll just save you all kinds of time. Watch out for those limitations and gotchas that we talked about. And that's not a finite list. <laughs> there are others that you may come across, but those are the common ones that I see. And then take advantage of uh, the resources that are out there, free and otherwise. Okay, so thank you for your time. And if we have uh, any questions, I think there was one over here on the side. Did you have a question or were you? No, not you guys behind. I'm sorry, I don't want to point, but. I can, but Yeah, oh, okay, great, okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes, let's get the mic to capture this. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how uh, queries are performed? Uh, how they're performed? Do you mean how the, like, the translation between the CMIS query and what's probably a, a Lucene query on the, in the, on the Alfresco yes. side? I don't have, that's a great question for Greg or um, Andy, uh, Andy Hind would be a, either of those two people would be, that would be a great person to ask. I don't know, and I'm blissfully uh, unaware of how that query translation happens. Um, the, uh, but the, the syntax is quite elaborate, so you can do date range searches and, uh, and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, ultimately that's going to get turned into some sort of either a Lucene search or a node service call um, on the back end. And, and that's up to those guys to tell you how that works. I have no idea, sorry. Um, anyone else have a question? Yes. Uh, does Siemens support uh, sorting in queries? Yes, there is an order by clause. Okay. Yep, that's not, that's not a problem. Okay, that, that's yeah, all. You're welcome. Anyone else? Did, uh, what are, like, just, uh, if, does anyone have any feedback? Did you learn something from the talk, or was, uh, yes, I hear, I, I, I see some people, eh. Yeah, okay, most people learn something, I hope. Uh, I know some people are really experts at CMIS already, so, uh, but this was aimed at beginners, so hopefully you learned something. I appreciate your time, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys around the conference. So thank you.